saw from a couple of years on, things are real horrible here in New York, all over. You're dealing with a lot of uh, people that are maniacs today. You're dealing with an individual who's very basic, who only knows two things, rip off or be ripped off. Many of those who make good by being bad are nowhere to be seen these days. I'd be afraid. Of course I'd be afraid. He's a sick guy. He'd kill any time. You ever wish there isn't anything on earth that I will hide from or back up from. People seem not to understand the close relationship between organized crime and street crime. And certainly in dealing with street crime in his area or any other kind of crime, uh, the uniform uh, patrol... Presenzano shot four times, his throat cut. Presenzano was allegedly connected. Okay, I was uh, muted. Amateur hour. So we're going to get right into it. Welcome back to NYC Crime Spot. We're going <laughs> to... Manny's laughing behind the scenes. So uh, we're going to be talking about, if you saw the thumbnail, Michael Francis. Sometimes they call him the wine merchant. He had a recent interview with one David Berkowitz, which is pretty interesting. You got to give him credit for uh, getting that done. I was left uh, unimpressed, however, with the interview. And Manny Grossman, the number one Son of Sam expert, in the uh world at large is going to be here joining me today before we get to this i just want to say that i want everybody to go to michael francis's channel check out the full interview for yourselves we are going to be doing a little critique we're going to play clips of it uh and i'm pretty sure that would fall under fair use if not mr francis's team well, please forgive me. We're just going to be critiquing the interview and talking a little bit about it. And Manny Grossman, who is an expert on the case, is going to give his insight. So let's get Manny here. Manny, what's going on, my man? What's going on, Crime Spot and audience? Uh, hey, how you doing out there? Doing good. Doing good, man. So thanks for coming on. And uh, I know you did a little walk and talk breakdown, but I figured I'd have you on. For new people here, there's definitely going to be some people that might not know you. So. Real quick, who the hell are you? What do you do? Well, my name is Manny Grossman, and uh, for the past three years and, and change, I've been leading a, an investigation, a modern investigation into the Son of Sam crimes. I started out as a Maury Terry freak, thinking that there was a cult. Uh, because of the popularity of our video series, it forced the release of so many new documents, police files, detective files, investigation files, Berkowitz's letters, and so on and so forth that we've never seen before. <clears throat> it made me turn around a complete 180 into a uh, total critic of Maury Terry because I realized how much the guy lied, bullied, manipulated, abused, was drunkard, was a cigarette smoker, was a not good friend, would send you 1,500 feet this way when he really meant to send you 1,500 feet that way. Yeah. And uh, and so on and so forth. So I run a channel called The Grossman Files, where we deal with uh, Son of Sam Truth, sober Son of Sam Truth, PhD level Son of Sam Truth, where we don't insult your intelligence with tales of <laughs> Satanism <laughs> or Druidism or any, or any of that kind of crap. Yep, yep. So everybody who's not uh, subscribed, please go over and subscribe to Manny. And don't get it twisted. Don't look at the subs and be like, oh, this guy's not really doing his thing. He's been through a couple of iterations of the channel. At one time, he was blowing up. I don't know. He's been back and forth, but a lot of people pay attention uh, to what he does. So he's putting a lot of work. Like he said, three years. So get yeah, over Yeah, I didn't that. realize that blowing up my first channel would get rid of all the uh, subscribers, too. I thought for some <laughs> somehow I'd keep them if I got rid of the video. I don't even know what happened. But, you had like uh, 25, right? You had basically what I have now. Yeah, yeah. close Manny to. And he was close killing to... the game, guys, just so yeah. you guys know. I wanted to let you guys know that. Let me just say hi to a couple of people, and then we'll get into it. Big Pin Fitness, my man, what's going on? Russell Tolbert, Go67. Jesse, what's going on? Roro, of course, the great Roro. Pete D, what is going on, my man? Greg, great, glad to see you here, my man. Lord Face, uh, Big Pin Fitness. Hey, Strong Island's Finest, what's up, my man? Hey, give me a call. I think I missed your last call. I apologize for that. 
DL, what's going on, my man? We're going to get into it. Andrew W., Darren Cassidy. All right, cool. So, Manny. Yep. Before we get into this interview, I want you to give a background to a to a certain character who is people are going to be seeing when they go to Michael Francis's channel and they watch the interview in full. People are going to be seeing this guy sitting next to David the entire time, kind of looking at him, kind of observing and putting his two cents in. Who is that gentleman in the interview? Well, that's uh, Dr. Michael Caparelli, PhD, who has written a book called Monster Mirror, um, which is a, 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 an accounting of 100 hours sitting with David Berkowitz, and it uh, deals with the psychology of David Berkowitz through the lens of Christianity, and, uh, and, and it filters everything through that. So the reason why I became attracted to him and his book was because, well, for the first time in the modern era, Berkowitz actually admitted that he lied to Maury Terry, that he made up the entire, well, he didn't make up the cult story. He agreed to Maury Terry's who sell, which means bullshit, folks. He agreed to, Ma to Maury Terry's who sell because Maury Terry was paying the guy. He was giving him prison commissary. He was helping out his father. He was sending Bibles here, Bibles there, Bibles everywhere. Yeah, and just for everyone listening, Maury yeah. Terry, for you guys who don't know, watch the Netflix. He wrote The Ultimate Evil. He's basically the main character in the Netflix documentary. It's kind of focusing on this guy with the satanic panic and the cults and everything like that. Right. So that's Michael Caparelli, PhD. And uh, and so his book, Monster Mirror, made quite a splash when it came out, I think last October. I'm not quite sure when it came out. And I don't have anything personally against Michael Caparelli, PhD. Um, personally, I think he's a nice guy. We've interacted behind the scenes. I don't have anything against him. The My critiques of this, as, as we will see of this uh, interview, was mainly with Franchisi. And um, uh, my my issues are substantive. It has nothing to do with personality or, or people. I couldn't care less about either one of them um, in terms of like, I'm not here to, hurt, to, to, to throw them under the bus or to insult them personally. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to add something to the screen. And I know that thank everybody. Well, second. I know that one of your initial issues, once again, this is from Michael Francis's <laughs> channel. Recent interview he did with David Berkowitz. Please go over there. Roro, drop uh, Mr. Franzese's channel. Um, and we are going to be critiquing this for educational purposes, of course, because we have an expert here. So I'm wait, mad. so you pronounce it Francese because Franci I've been pronouncing Michael it Francese. All right, because I've been yeah. pronouncing Francis or Francisi, you can do that. But the cheesy, right. no, it's not cheesy. It's not cheesy. All right. I no, thought it was cheese, more, cheesy, yeah. franchisee, franchise. No, yeah. Yeah. So uh yeah, some people will give you shit for that, of course. Whatever. What's up, corruption? So one of the things you didn't like was the video started like this. I just want to thank everybody. I've been getting such good, good uh uh, referrals and just a lot of praise for Franzese wine. So I want to bring you up to date quickly. I'm going to actually have a sip of it while I do. Um, we're in a number of states now. Edit. Uh, we're in 150. Okay. That's re this is ridiculous. This is incredibly insulting. First of all, it's extremely low class. It's low rent. It's very tacky. You're starting an interview, a video of an interview with one of the most notorious and infamous and famous serial killers of all time. A guy who actually in the real world is presently constituted, took six innocent lives, several of which were his paisanas. They were his people. They, they were they were they were the ch Italian American children. Donna Loria, Valentina Suriani, Judy Placido, Robert Violante. And this guy's sitting here, starting it out, hawking his wine, drinking a glass of wine while he does it. First of all, isn't that anti-Christian? One would say. I mean, I, so anyway, I'm. I, I I thought that was tacky. I mean, look. Okay. I mean, okay. Know, I thought that was very low class. Dave Moth, what's up, man? Thanks for being here. <clears throat> so let me move forward a little bit. We're gonna move. All right. So. This is kind of in the beginning, and this is a little before David even enters the picture. We talk about depression and God's forgiveness. So let, let's let's see kind of what they say. And I have a, an issue with something in this clip myself. So let, let's look a little bit into this. It wasn't just destroying other people. Mm -hmm. um, he was destroying himself. And, it, you know, that, that depression, believe it or not, undergirds much of the rage 
we see in our culture. God made it clear it's not good for man to be alone. We need community. And uh, that's really one of the important messages of the book is the importance of relationship, relationship with people and mainly relationship with, with God. Uh, well, you know, my, I spent 29 months and seven days in isolation. And if it wasn't for my relationship with the Lord and my relationship with my wife and children, you know, even though I wasn't with them, I knew they were there. And I was still in the community of family. I don't know that I would have made it through it. And I saw a lot of things go wrong in there with guys that didn't have that. Mm. It was fortunate. And uh, that's why I'm so interested in speaking to David, because look, I gotta be real honest with you. You know, it's, it's very hard. Forgiveness is a very hard concept. Yes, yes. You realize if somebody would hurt your family. Somebody, Absolutely. Uh, forgiveness is so difficult. And, um, but if you're not a Christian, you don't understand God's, it's beyond you to understand how you can forgive. Truth. Okay, so if you're not a Christian, it's beyond you to understand how you can forgive. Um, so in other words, you could only forgive if you're Christian. Essentially, that's kind of what he's saying. Like a Jewish person, a Muslim person, or they, whatever person, they don't have uh, some sort of forgiveness in them. Or understanding. Of, do me a favor. Get that thing off so, so we don't have to read that while we're talking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um. I mean, I don't know. I didn't catch that. But yeah, I mean, it is a kind of a bizarre statement. I don't know if he really meant what he what he actually said. But yeah, I mean, only Christians know how to forgive. That's a little weird. Yeah. Now, with the theme, th there's going to be a big theme of uh, depression throughout this interview. And as we as we kind of move forward with the interview, it's going to be kind of things maybe david says oh i didn't know i was depressed i didn't know at the time and you know it's been brought out of me now that now i know what, what do you think about that moving forward that theme of depression well <clears throat> well i mean even if david was the most depressed person on the planet it doesn't it's no excuse or reason to go out and kill people i mean i've gone through depression i'm sure you have everybody in the audience has gone through depression depression is really a human normal human emotion for most of us at some point in our lives do we go out and kill so i'm i can't really say that i'm buying that uh depression i mean i could uh, listen David already told us how, why he did did everything in 1979, and we'll we'll get into that hopefully a little later. And it was, of course, depression, but mixed with all sorts of other things. You know, depression was just like one little bit of an entire one little ingredient in the stew. Yeah. Okay, and I think right now David is going to be jumping in here. In my childhood, I had issues with with depression with anger, with other things that may have been tied to this sense of deep guilt, which was mm -hmm. un, un, uh, I was not conscious of, but this deep guilt uh, that I caused my mother's death that must have really haunted me. And I did a lot of self-destructive, had the self-destructive self behavior patterns. I also was very hyperactive in school. Uh, it was a very difficult student in, in school, in public school. You talk about the so, urges to die, the urges to hurt you. I don't know what's going on. So is there anything you want to say about that as far as um, because he was told something when he was a child, according to him, about his birth mother, right? Yeah, according to, <clears throat> to him at five. And I'm not even sure whether that story is actually true or not. I have to go back to my vi my video interview with John Comparetto, who was a friend of his at uh, Co-op City. Because I believe we talk about when he found out that he was adopted. And there's something in here saying that he found out when he was a teenager. But I'm just I'm not saying that this is true. I have to go back to my video and, and, and see. But um I mean it's very milk toast answer. He thought that it might have contributed. He saw later in life that possibly the the guilt of his mother dying when he was five or whatever he found out that he was adopted and that he killed his mother in childbirth <clears throat> it doesn't sound like that like he's very committed to that answer it sounds like right. something that that uh that was sort of taught to him 
as a potential um as a potential reason and again this is my biggest problem with this interview this is who sell this is complete shit we know why he killed in 1979 he wrote extensive letters to his to his uh, a psychiatrist detailing in excruciating detail why he killed and uh, it's actually quite sick stuff maybe in a little while we'll look at some of those things i, I called a few of those out okay <clears throat> sounds good yeah who sao everybody Hu that sao. means bullshit in chinese folks <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it i love to see it all right student in a school in public wait school. hold on go back a little yeah there we sure go. sure you want me to which yeah, was yeah, uh, uh, what do you want me to do well i i we're into a new clip so i just want to make no, sure that was the, the end of the, of the the last one i think okay yeah okay yeah. so this is daring and death defying My mother's death that must That's have really down. haunted yeah. me and Sorry, i God. did a lot of self-destructive i had to self self-destructive behavior patterns. I also was very hyperactive in school. Uh, was a very difficult student in, in school, in public school. You talk about the urges to die, the urges to hurt yourself at a young age. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was uh, very, uh, I would say, uh, kind of like self-harm. I would just take, take risks and chances, you know, going on the rooftops of buildings, Running down the streets, riding my bicycle through traffic, uh, you know, going to playing around with the subway trains. We'd run, me and a couple of my friends, we'd run down the uh, platform from station to station, you know, like the, the above ground elevated rides and things like that, you know, just, uh, I, I don't know, I just, I realized a little old, but I was older that I had some kind of death wish or something. And it was mm -hmm. very, uh, you know, so there was a lot of self destructive behavior pattern some weird okay so let me uh remove that so what is your opinion on that sound exactly like my childhood i rode bicycles in and out of traffic i ran down train tracks i did all sorts of death defying feats as a child just like you just like everybody in the audience for the most part what does that have to do with his later spree this dude is just saying that oh yeah because i i i jumped on roofs of buildings which tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of other kids did by the way who yeah. didn't go on to kill yeah. um that made me realize i had a death wish this dude is getting the most pat psychological answers i don't know where he's getting them from or how he realized especially since we know why he killed he told right, us in right. stark detail in 1979. well manny like i don't know Caparelli, right? Sitting next to him. I have, like you said, you've spoken to him. I'm sure you guys are cordial or whatever. I know nothing about him. But I guess if somebody even just looked at that interview and so behavioral scientists with the Christian edge, you might say, oh, I know exactly where he's getting it from. Would that, I mean. Um, what, what do you mean? I'm sorry. Say that again. As far as what, what David is saying with all this childhood trauma that all of a sudden he, he's talking about and now oh i had a death wish oh i was a dangerous kid stuff like that yeah is he absorbing that through hours of conversations with the guy sitting next to him is that behavioral well, scientist with with the christian spin uh, is that is he pulling that out of him somehow well i didn't hear much christianity in there so we can, i think we can discount the christianity part of that but the uh psychi psychological yeah definitely i wouldn't say for, that we can we can say for sure that it came from caparelli i, I think that's a, a a stretch because this dude has been psychoanalyzed and probably thinking about himself for many, many years. So I don't know whether that specifically came from Mike. I, I'm not I'm not prepared to say either way, but that's definitely like a coached answer. That's definitely something yeah. that uh, he gave a lot of thought to. He this guy curates his interviewer interviewers. He only speaks to people that put out put out the message that he wants them to put out. The guy is a monstrous ego, incredible narcissist. And um, and what I see there is just a pat psychological answer, which makes no sense whatsoever. And he had to learn it from somewhere, whether it came from Mike. I, I can't say one way or the other. I don't, okay. I don't think it even matters. OK, do you want me to add to the stage what you put there yet or no? 
Well, I've been saying that he's that he 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 said why he killed. I think we should back it up with some evidence. So let's throw that up for the audience. Right? So Dr. Abramson. Now, this is in 1979. Since I've been in Attica and before that Marseille, I've had a few problems in adjusting to the regimented life in you know, prison. In fact, I'm doing quite well and I'm getting along with both guards and inmates. I've also done quite a bit of self-analysis and I am now mentally aware as to the reasons why I committed most of these crimes. I've known the true motives for quite some time, but I deliberately kept them below the surface because of my fear in hurting certain persons. In other words, I did know why I pulled the trigger. I did know why I deliberately killed. I knew who the person was whom I wanted to hurt, on whom I wanted revenge. These shootings were planned long before they took place. Nobody knows this. Nobody knows the reasons but me, and perhaps one day, you. So here's the guy saying in 1979 that he knows exactly why he killed. I have a couple more things which we can look at in a little bit. We could, oh. You want to look at him now? We'll look at him now, yeah. Well, I mean, just here's some things, right? I'm a lot mm -hmm. more conscious of things in my mind than people think. I played stupid in Kings County Hospital like I didn't know what was going on inside my head. However, I really did know. I knew why I killed and things. I knew I needed a girlfriend, that I wasn't crazy, that I wanted to be the center of attention. I love the limelight the army, auxiliary police and fire departments. I wanted to make a dramatic rescue to be a hero. I really want the praise of the community. Women, I blame them for everything. Everything evil that's happened in this world, somehow it goes back to them. I hate them for messing up everything in this world. They really screwed my life up good. So here's a guy who's shot people, shot, and he's talking about them screwing his life up. Right. The monstrous ego, the self-awareness, the self-analysis, the he's saying that he knew why he did it. In this interview with with uh, Capra, I'm sorry, with Franchise, he's talking about, oh, I don't know what happened. I don't know why I did it. To say what led up to the shootings is very difficult. It was a whole host of things. Everything from inconsiderate neighbors who made noise to too many bills, to a series of rotten jobs, to a rotten social life, and a horrifying feeling of becoming an old bachelor or dirty old man. I had no women in my life. It was just too much. I never felt so hopeless, so powerless against those noisy forces in my neighborhood. I felt like worthless shit. Never would there be peace and quiet. Never would I have a real girlfriend and intimate com companionship to share my life with. I wanted these things so much, but they seemed unattainable, right? I guess I just exploded. I couldn't take it anymore. I had to destroy the people who were mentally oppressing me. I felt that they were women who were doing this to me and the neighbors with their yelping dogs being tired of all this damn shit. I just struck back, right? I can live with what my did. I don't have nightmares over it to hell with what anyone says. I felt justified. And here he is talking about wanting to kill his, his natural family, right? I was troubled over my sudden urges after the shooting began. I would visit my sister, uh, Queens was special to me, shooting someone with Queens when I got bad urges about my family, knowing my gun was so close, yet frightened by my thoughts, I just go take a long walk, and so on and so forth. So why is he playing dumb to Francesi in this video? Why is he saying, oh, I don't know why I killed. I don't know what led me to all this. He, he, here he, I, have, I could show you a thousand more pages, crime spot. Yeah, when, and you know what? I'm looking at the chat, and it's like, because you're bringing all, you know, all the evidence and all the facts and showing people all the stuff. I mean, like I said in the beginning, this is what I said about Manny being the expert. Greg says, holy shit, big for turkey, fascinating stuff. Is there any books on this subject? So, well, go to my video series. It's called The Grossman Files. If uh, Ruby's in the in the chat today, maybe she can throw a link down. I think Roro Ro, Ro will. I haven't seen Ruby, but. Yeah, and and basically, there's a website that you can visit. It's called the Queen's DA, the People vs. David Berkowitz. It has all these files for you to download, and you can download all his letters to a psychiatrist, and you can read them all for yourself. I want people to do this research. I want people to come, become more educated because <clears throat> the story on Son of Sam has, has changed. It's no longer the talking dog, and it's no longer Maury Terry's complete and utter huso. We know the truth finally. And that's why I'm so pissed at this Franchisi interview because it's like 
why you, this is such a wasted opportunity. You have the son of Sam in front of you when you're first talking about wine and sorry, I'm talking so much crime spot, but you're no, first taught, was... you're first talking about selling so wine. King. <laughs> you're, you're first talking about selling wine. Okay. It's yeah. an insult. And then you're, and then you have the son of Sam in front of you, someone who I would personally love to be in a room with one-on-one -on -one and ask him some real questions. And you're sitting there talking about, Oh, I don't know why I did it. Oh, I have no clue why this all happened. And it must've been depression and death defying feats as a child. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's so stupid. It's just yeah. as stupid as Ronnie DeFeo walking into the bar that day going, they shot my family. You guys want to see where that happened? You can uh, watch <laughs> Manny Grossman and NYC crime spot. We went to that location, but uh, no, it's interesting, you know, and it really, it really says a lot about like when these guys become really big and they don't really have to do too much like research and they have a team behind them, you know, when you, every day there's like a fluff interview on somebody that's coming out, you know? Yo, so but this is the son of Sam. This is what I expect. You know, this is kind of what you got to expect at the end of the day. When well, France, Francis was woefully inadequately prepared for this interview. He doesn't know oh, the first yeah. thing about the son of Sam case. He said seven people were shot. It was, were killed. It was actually six. That's an insult to the victims right there. I don't have anything against this guy personally. I don't know Michael Francis. I don't personally care one way or the other about him, <clears throat> but Mike, you strode into my territory and you took a big fat shit all over it. I'm pissed. That's right. I think this calls for a sit down, Michael. <laughs> Let's continue. <laughs> so the next part of this clip I titled The Devil Sought Out David Berkowitz. Hi, David, you're in your 20s. Yeah. When did this turn into something more? Because for me, and being a, a brother in Christ, I think these things are demonic. It, absolutely. It's yeah, for me. That when people, when the devil, when Satan sees somebody struggling like this, you're a perfect mark. It's <laughs> demonic. And especially if you're not walking with the Lord at that God. It's, it's so hard to overcome. Yet here, what, what all of a sudden make this thing? Well, like, again, it's, it's in, in, in my childhood, I had issues with, with depression with anger, with other things that may have been tied to this sense of deep guilt, which was, mm -hmm. un, un, uh, I was not conscious of, but this deep guilt uh, that I caused my mother's death that must have really haunted me. And uh, I, you know, I was trying to live my life, but I was showing some signs of disturbance that I met my, my birth family, had a wonderful mm -hmm. uh, time meeting them, and we had a good relationship. Uh, I was over there a lot to the houses in Queens. And yeah, yeah, my sister, my sister, who I found after you know 20, 22 years, my birth mother, she's a wonderful lady. Uh, I found out I had a brother-in-law, had two nieces, and also an extended family. It was like, a, my life was like, a whole new life was opening up. But at the same time, I had internal issues that I was dealing with. Um, I was trying to find my way. You gotta stop that. All right, listen, do, do you wanna go or should I? Can't hear you. Can't hear you. I'm going to say uh, one thing real quick, and then I'll let you go. Uh, and we're going to see a theme throughout this interview that I would love to talk to you about, too. It's the theme of things are going real good for David. That's like a theme that has appeared two or three times in this interview, and we're going to see more of it. But then you juxtapose that with depression and, you know, the devil's getting a hold of him. Things are looking up for David. He's got a job. He's meeting his family. So it's this kind of weird battle within this interview of like these two things somehow going on at the same time. Now, you can go. I would love you to comment on uh, David being a mark for the devil because I enjoyed that part of it. Well, David being a mark for the devil, what he describes is perfectly normal childhood mark for the devil. Give me a break. Um so that's really all I have to say about that. I don't have much of a of a deep thing about that, but what I would like to say is that 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 clip that you just played juxtapose that with what we just read in his letter. He's saying, "Oh, my birth mother, she was great. I used to love going to over to their house. It was like a whole new family, a whole new life." Yeah, meanwhile, we just heard about how he would get urges to shoot them. 
and he's writing that in 1979. So it's like pretty close to the events. So he's who sowing. <clears throat> sorry, he's who sowing Francis here. He's who sowing Caparelli. He's carefully curating curating those who who put out his story, and um, I find it to be absolutely disgusting and incredibly insulting to the victims of the, these of his victims. 91 people in here. Please hit the like and go over to follow Manny's channel. Roro G keeps dropping the link for the channel. You guys, you're not going to get this anywhere. You can go on some mob tube channel with some person that just wants to make fun of Michael Franzese and do some troll video. This is a real reaction from a real expert on the subject. So I hope you guys are enjoying this conversation. Seems like you are. We got over 90 people in here right now. What's going on, peeps? Please visit my channel, The Grossman. Oh, thanks, here Roro. <laughs> <laughs> Roro's always on the spot. <clears throat> Roro's the greatest. And Roro's so got a wrench in my uh, my channel too. Yeah, she's uh she's got a couple uh a couple of uh, other channels. She's becoming a uh an entire toolbox of wrenches. She's but you, you know, another thing I want to say about that clip we just saw was that this whole thing about oh I I, I had deep guilt about about my mother birth mother dying and i thought i killed her but i wasn't yeah. conscious of it i mean come on i mean if you're not conscious of something that means it has no effect on you i mean you're not conscious of it it's not guiding anything in you give me a break this was something that he learned later in life from counseling i'm not saying it came from caparelli but he's he's speaking right. he's speaking the lingo uh very carefully of uh of of, of in my opinion total psychobabble so many people were told that they killed their mother in childbirth that were adopted. They, they, they didn't they didn't become the son of Sam. I mean, give me a break. This what they this was a soft way out interview. They allowed this dude to totally who sell them and 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 curate the answers. And it didn't seem like they cared or knew a GD thing about this case. This is an insult. This is the son of right. Sam. This is the person I, I want to get into a room with. Um and, and actually have a real conversation with. But you know what? He won't talk to me. I already know he won't talk to me. He, he no. won't talk to me because I got his number and he can't who sell me. Yeah, let me ask you something. As far as him not talking to you, have you ever gotten any <clears throat> intel from somebody or any idea that he knew what was Hell going on? Hell yeah. He knows yeah. everything about me. Berkowitz is a monstrous narcissist. He has to read and, and listen to and, and watch everything about him. So I already know that actually, <laughs> this is what's in interesting about it, his alleged Christian friends, and I am not putting Caparelli into this, okay, just so we're clear about this, Right. but he's got Christian friends all over the place, and there are a lot of so-called alleged Christians who are big on the Maury Terry Hussau, the, the cult crap, Right. Um, and so he, they blacklisted me with him. They, some people who are like Christians with him right. told him all about me, but who sowed him in the process? They, they lied and they said that, you know, so, so apparently Ber David Berkowitz hates my guts. That's the, <laughs> that's the intel I've gotten. But you know hey, what? Listen. He, 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 he knows that I know everything about him. That's the thing. Yeah. Well, being hated by that guy, I, I don't know if that's a bad thing or a good thing, you know? Yeah, I mean, no one could interview him like I can. I've spoken to most of his childhood friends, especially the intimate ones. I've spoken to the people he served in the auxiliary with. I've spoken to his victims. I've spoken to friends of his victims. I've read every document, paper, letter that the dude ever put out. Let's just put it this way. It would be a much more interesting interview than what you got with French Cezy. Okay, I agree. So the next clip is titled Moving Constantly and Finding the Occult. And nothing seemed to work out. I went out of the apartment and it, was, it wasn't the best. And I got frustrated there with the neighbors and I moved again and I moved again. And I met some other people that said, uh, you know, one of the fine friends, I, I ran into some bad people that were not, uh, you know, but just into some occult stuff. It sounded interesting to me. And so we, we used to go to Pelham Bay Park once in a while and, and just hang out and meet there and smoke dope. And But this time I was, you know, working, I was doing all, trying to make ends meet, you know, and uh, just a lot of life pressures. I, it was just a very vulnerable time. I was open to things. And, uh, and I don't have right? my notes to leave it up. 
I, I have, um, I feel I was really tra traumatized by Dima since I was a child. And I've gotten so much evidence of this over the, over the years. Uh, after I became a Christian, I didn't understand it back then, but, but I, the Lord opened up my eyes years later to see all of these different events that gel, kind of gelled together to cause this to happen. And uh, uh, I always had a fascination with like dark, the darkness. Thoughts? All right. Well, I have a couple of thoughts on that. First of all, Berkowitz is not a liar. All right. People say that he's a compulsive liar. He's a, here's what I say about Berkowitz and the truth and lies. Berkowitz lies, but he's not a liar. He mixes who sow with truth in the same sentence. And he did it in what you just saw. He actually gave you some good intel there. He was talking about his terrible apartment situations. We just read that in his letter from 1979. Look, those two are actually correlating and mixing with one another. Isn't that interesting? The, the lousy apartments, the noise, the frustrations. And then he starts in talking about, oh, and then I met people and I started hanging out with them. And the, there, there's where he lies. This... This um, book by Mike Caparelli gets finally gets the truth out that he worked alone in Son of Sam, but it also hedges its bets. It, 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 Berkowitz also says, yeah, but I hung out with two brothers in Untermeyer Park and there was Moloch there uh, uh, who was the spiritually sick um, pederast Nobel Prize winner Carlton V. Gaju sect. They named him in the book as Moloch. Well, crime spot we know that moloch doesn't exist because right, we just interviewed right. billy the artist who was right. the originator of moloch and he said it was gimel ishby from conan number 38 it was literally and we, saw, and we saw the comic we saw the images yeah it was literally a comic book yeah so mixing truth with lies is what berkowitz does he lies but he's not a liar he's been remarkably consistent over the years but every now and then he'll find people with who he, he whom he could get out some alternate message with. Yeah. He did it with Terry, and he did it, and I believe he's doing it with Franchise. So um, that's basically all I have to say about that clip. Uh, I'm going to read this comment okay, from Jay. Said, no, "Please, uh, Michael Francis is messed up interviewing a monster just to help his own career by not telling this guy he actually an evil. He's actually an evil person." So. What I didn't play is in the beginning of that video before the wine commercial, he did talk about, you know, guys, people aren't going to like this. I know you're not going to like this, but I believe in forgiveness and this and that. You know, so he had to preface it just for anyone that was going to get upset about it. Uh, he prefaced that video with, you know, you're not going to like it, maybe, but I believe in forgiveness and the Christian path and everything else. So I hope that answers kind of what you're wondering about, Jay said. So, uh, Put up Book Club Warrior's comment because it's book very true. Warrior, the great Book Club Warrior. So in my opinion, Berkowitz is the most honest during 19 hours of interview prison reporter Jack Jones in 1980. The killer tapes pot? Absolutely. And Jack Jones was a guest on our um, on our, on our our series along with his co-producer, Bill Badgley. And they have a thing called the killer tapes, which is like 19 hours of audio with Berkowitz done in the same period where he was writing those letters. And he says mm -hmm. remarkably consistent stuff to Jack Jones that he says to his psychiatrist. And... Um, it's very interesting stuff, and all the answers are for you there as well. Taxi driver, for instance, yeah. huge influence on Berkowitz. Was David a virgin? No, Bigfoot. David Berkowitz was not a virgin. And what's interesting about the taxi driver thing is you kind of surmise that on your own it kind of i mean it made sense when you look at it but then it finally came out right a year ago or whatever it was no what happened was live on the air we were talking to john comparetto and jim fay two people who knew berkowitz in those early years and uh as we're on the air john comparetto gets a text from jeff hartenberg who was david berkowitz's best friend in co-op city saying oh david used to ride around in a green army jacket because he loved the movie taxi driver wow so live on the air we broke that we didn't know that in 1979 he told jack right. jones the same thing mm -hmm. so the two of us confirmed it i got it from his actual friend and jack jones got it from berkowitz himself and uh then we then we started doing analysis about that Right, right. So the next clip is cult groupthink leading to a dark path. 
Keep in mind, 22, he's out of the army, lonely, mm -hmm. looking for belonging, needing companionship. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, you run into a group of people that are offering that. Um, they were basically sickness. Oh, yeah, they're far young. And there's, there's, a, there's a synergy mm -hmm. that happens. You know, you know it when you're in a crowd. Yeah. Um, that synergy, um, in, in psychology, they call it de-individuation, where a person loses their like, personal identity, kind of become um, immersed in the group. And now that sort of a group think, if you want to call it that, uh, it empowers an individual. In the animal kingdom, wolves behave much more ferociously in packs than they do when they're walking in the jungle alone. Well, I mean, that's basically what it's talking about you know the group think um we're gonna get to some of that cult stuff later but what do you think about as far as what he was saying about david kind of i guess it doesn't he, even make it doesn't even make sense first of yeah. all there was no cult so he wasn't meeting with anybody and there was no influence outside influence on him by anybody to, so that's a false premise right there but even if even if you take what he's saying is true, a, a wolves act harder in packs and great. He went out alone and did these shootings. He wasn't with anyone else to 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 work in a pack with. Right. So that just doesn't even make logical sense. I mean, um, you know, I get it. If you I, I, what he's making sense is what he's saying is actually true. If you're talking about an actual group. But Burke was wasn't with a group. There was no cult. So right. therefore, all that stuff is just I don't know why he's pushing that because he got Berkowitz to admit that he did the shootings alone. <clears throat> so I don't understand this fence sitting and this playing both sides aspect of it because it makes no sense. And again, the reason why I could say this with such bold authority is because I've proven Berkowitz has acted alone with actual evidence and forensics. So, um, you know, there we go. Let me just see some of the comments. There was something else I wanted to address. Uh, Bigfoot Turkey, he said something about, I was surprised how small the 44 caliber was. I thought it would be bigger. So he had a bulldog 44, right? Yeah. And on my channel, I did a, a, a live stream with uh, um, Mill Serp Garage. And we did a whole thing where we even went to a range and shot the 44. We show close-ups. We show the bullets. So yeah. Bigfoot, if you want a more intimate look at the actual Charter Arms 44, you got a nice 45-minute video to watch on my channel. Yeah, and I know nothing about uh, guns, but that thing had a hell of a kick on it, man. It major pretty, kick, major yeah. kick, but wild if held with one hand. And uh, Berkowitz did the early shootings with one hand. That's the reason why Carl Denaro is still alive, while Joanne Lomino and Donna Damasi are still alive, and um, and so on and so forth. And the Bayside shooting too, right? Uh, Placido and Placido. Uh, no, he was doing two hand by then. He oh, was really? he was on the hunt to kill. He said okay. he said after that shooting that he had no idea how they survived that. He was aiming for the head, and he did shoot Judy in the head. But for some reason, the bullet yeah. went in, and it did one of these things where it skimmed the surface of the skull. And it ended up like right here under the under her skin of the forehead. Wow, that's wild. Yeah. How about this question, Mark Gonzalez? Uh, did he once claim to have a dog tell him to go out and kill? And if so, do you think that was attempt to claim insanity? Yes. The answer to both is uh, yes, he did do that, and yes, he he did that to uh, seem insane so he could get sent to a mental institution. Okay. Next clip is. David had a lot of good things going for him. Well, I mean, I struggled to find my place in society. I mean, I had a lot of good things going for me. I, became, I uh, took a postal exam. I became a postal worker. I was working with a good crew of people on the, on the midnight shift and, and things like that. And, uh, but still, I was dealing with internal issues. Uh, you be, the term would be mental health issues, but I know it was also spiritual issues located in the Bronx. You know, I just had issues within myself that were causing my, uh, me a lot of self-harm. I think what's eye-opening about David's story, you know, sometimes he's painted in the media as being this loner. The reality is he was a part of an Appalachian mountain club uh, where they climb mountains, not far from here, the Gunks. He's part of baseball teams. He was part of a volunteer fireman club in, in the Bronx. So he's very socialized. 
we think isolation means the loner in the corner hiding. Uh, in his case, the reality is he was very socialized, yeah. but amidst the crowd, lonely, deeply. All right. So here's my problem once again. We keep talking about depression and this and that. And David's talking about earlier, we mentioned a little bit, he gets out of the army. He discovers this brand new family. I have family here. I'm going to my sisters. I'm going, oh, so I got this. Now he's talking about he was a part of some climbing club. He's in this group. He's doing this. To be honest, he's doing a lot more than I was doing at 21, 22. No, no, no. I, we got to clarify something. We got to clarify. Those those Appalachian clubs were when he was a teenager, when he was a, that wasn't when it, that, I see why you thought that because Caparelli did put that in linearly, but those climbing yeah. clubs and the and okay. the stuff that he was talking about was all when he was like a, 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 a 13, 14 years old. All right. Okay. But that is, but that is good. So then he goes to the army, but he finds the, he connects with the family after the army, right? 22, 23 Correct. years old. Yeah. Right. So he's got that. That's going for him. He says he's getting a job. I mean, that seems like like this new birth of like love and positive energy is coming into his life. I mean, he kind of yeah, and then he's still right, and that's true. And at the same time, he wanted to kill his family. And in the real world, as presently constituted, this dude was actually going out and shooting people in the head with the intent and aim to kill. So we just have to say to ourselves that really the only way to make sense of this crime spree, because it wasn't a cult, he didn't have help. And um, the only way to really make sense of it is like this dude's brain is just organically different from yours, bro, and mine and everyone else is out in the audience. He had the same experiences that we all did. He had the same childhood triumphs and tragedies. He had the maybe same better at times, maybe better at times. Arguably. Right. Right. He was part of the fire brigade. He used to go out and, 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 and ride, ride around the city as a teenager, helping it with auxiliary police. The dude was actually living La, La Vida Loca. He loved it. He was living large. And um, but he was wired differently. That's just the long and short of it. This dude's brain was wired in such a way that when he couldn't handle things the way that he dealt with it, was to go out and shoot someone in the head. It didn't have to be right. a woman. It didn't have to be a man. It didn't have to be a lover's lane. It didn't have to be a brunette, a blonde, a young and old. It was just whoever was there, there at the right time when he was prowling the streets looking for tasty meat. Yeah, yeah. There's this idea of adopted child syndrome, and I know of another serial Yo, get off that. Get off that quote on the bottom there. Yeah, so... There's this idea out there. You've probably heard of it before. Uh, this has been spoken about with Joel Rifkin. He's another one that this is spoken about, this whole adopted child syndrome thing. Rifkin was adopted. And I guess the idea behind it is like even if the the baby or the infant or whatever it may be is not aware of this transfer of family, intrinsically, like there is a something inside them that tells them, oh, I'm not with my mom anymore, right? I can I can get with that. I don't know whether yeah. you know I'm not a professional, but I can believe that. Right. So this has been spoken about with with Joel Rifkin, stuff like that. Does it ever come up with David? Because it it's kind of what they're saying almost in this interview, like this idea that um, or he may have killed his mother, right? Or that this idea that he was even adopted at all. Mm -hmm. Has that ever even come up? Like this whole adopted child syndrome thing? Have you ever came across that with David? Well, according to his friends, it really was not that big a deal. He didn't act uh, in any way, shape, or form angry about it. And I almost swear, I mean, I got to talk to Book Club about this, and we got to go back to my video, that he, that he, we, that Comparetto said he found out as a teenager, not as a five-year-old. So that's something that we got to look into. But the, no one seemed to think that there was any special trauma dealt dealing with his um, adoption. And quite frankly, he loved his adoptive mother, Pearl. Uh, he said that she was one of the very few people that showed him love and that he absolutely loved her. And he didn't have the greatest of relationships with his adoptive father, but they were OK with each other. There was no abuse there. Nothing really terrible going on. And uh, and so, no, he had just like a normal childhood. The dude was like doing everything that you or I did. He 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 even had girlfriends and hung out with girls. He had no issues with girls. Um, I do think that when he went to the army, he extensively used LSD 
and it just rewired his brain. And then maybe he had previous schizophrenic tendencies that always come out when you're 21 and 22. That's the age when they come out. Um, I used to be a social worker. I have very limited experience with it, but I did work for two summers uh, with with uh, schizophrenics. And I read every one of their case files because I was extremely interested. And without fail, they all turned schizophrenic at around 20, 21 years old, 22. Oh, wow. It's like, yeah. And even with my friend, my, my, one of my good friends, Miguel, he was perfectly normal. We went, we all went off to colleges, different colleges. He did a lot of LSD. We, we got back together. We went to go see a, a, one of these Japanese animation films called ghost in the machine or ghost yeah. in the shell or something. Ghost and the, the dude, shell, yeah. yeah, the dude literally turned schizophrenic that night. The next morning he was institutionalized. He left the theater and then he never came back. And then when we went to the car to go home, he was sitting on the car and he's talking about that plane is following me. <laughs> that movie was made just for me. And then the next morning he was institutionalized. So, wow. so I think Berkowitz was a schizophrenic and he was uh, had extremely homicidal tendencies and but at the same time he was also normal and could hold down a job somehow I mean it was, it's yeah. a strange psychology for sure but it existed and we just have to accept the fact that it existed as that individual human being called David Berkowitz and I don't really think it requires much analysis or or or, or deeper analysis than that yeah one of the things he also speaks about in this interview, Manny, is the idea of moving a lot. Oh, I mm -hmm. moved there. I couldn't get along with my neighbors, and I, and I moved a couple of more times. I mean, this guy seemed like he he couldn't stay still. He, he always came up with an excuse to, like, move somewhere else, blamed it on the neighbors. Uh, he sounds like the, the local nutcase like he was every, the every nutcase every neighborhood has like the local like lunatic that everybody knows oh there goes crazy uh crazy bobby there he that, is that's a great way to put it yeah and it's true because he comes back from the army he moves to 2161 barnes avenue where he proceeds to shoot the dogs in the alley behind him because they're barking all day long then he leaves there. Oh, oh, he also left a bunch of threatening letters to his neighbor in that building, too, threatening death for playing the TV too loud. That was in the Bronx. Then he moves to New Rochelle, where the, where he the, he knew they had two German shepherds when they when he moved in, but he moved in regardless. And within two months, he was leaving, screaming in the middle of the night, pounding his head because he couldn't deal with the noise. And then he ends up in a top floor apartment with a Hudson River view. You'd think that this dude would yeah. finally found peace. Yeah. But no, he has to start wigging out about 18 Wicker Street and 316 Warburton Avenue, the Ned Oden Carr family. He actually started Son of Sam in Yonkers. He started it right outside his front door and it emanated out into New York City. The first Son of Sam crime was actually May 13th, 1976, two months before the first shooting. It's when he went when he Molotov cocktail, the Netto house at 18 Wicker street. You've never heard of the Netto family. I have extensive interviews with them on my channel um, where you can, yeah. where you can, I'm not talking about you cold case. No, I'm no, talking no, about no. the audience yeah. um, where you can see me talking to the Nettos about all the crimes that David Berkowitz perpetrated on them. You heard about the Carr family because it was their dog Harvey that allegedly ordered him to kill. But, uh, Son of Sam started with the Netto family. It started in Yonkers, and it started when he moved to to Pine Street. Yeah. yeah. So it seemed like everywhere he went, and I think also in this interview, he says he even blamed the neighbors. I think in the interview, he said something like, "Oh, just they were the worst neighbors." Some off the cuff, he said something like that. Um, so yeah, everywhere this guy went, I mean, he just couldn't get along with anybody. No, he he had problems with his neighbors to the side. They were the Williams family. That's why he almost bashed a hole through the wall and then wrote on his wall here is mr williams hole he lives in this hole i'm turning my children into killers he hated his downstairs neighbor craig glassman to the point where he almost where he lit an arson fire in front of his door by the way did you you saw my video where i got into the building right into yes. his building yes that freaking door on the sixth floor it's still it's still crumpled from the arson they've never in 47 no, years really yeah, was it like a steel however, door or something it's the old door. It's the original door. And Berkowitz's door is original, too. You can see um, like where they pry barred it open and, and stuff That's like that. Wild. As well. yeah, you guys got to check that out where Manny Manny gets inside uh, the building. And one of the one of my favorite things on your channel is the drone footage of, of Yonkers and, and, you know, where he lived. 
Yeah, we we uh, were lucky enough to hook up with Mike Lorenzo, whose uh, son-in-law is a Yonkers PD, but also owns a drone company. Um, so we were able to cut right through the red tape and get that drone up in the air. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, so this is kind of the end of it, and then we'll just talk a little bit more about it. Uh, over 100 Show people off. here. So Wait, so got, there's a dude in the audience, Brian, who I want to address. I don't I don't want to I want to make sure, I want to make sure that he feels like I'm addressing him because he's really seems very angry about something. Uh, it seems like he's talking about Carl DeNaro, Netflix, and Carl knows who shot him. That's kind of what I'm getting out of that. Yeah. So Carl, Carl DeNaro? Yeah. Listen, I have a personal relationship or had a personal relationship with Carl. We were um fr very friendly. We did two videos together. Up until June 2021, when we all got the Maury Terry files and were able to scan the, the original Maury Terry personal files, as soon as we left that scanning session, Carl DeNaro never spoke to me again, and he started bad-mouthing me on Facebook. The dude's a terrible person. And also, I mean, I listen, I know he's a victim. I know I'm excoriating Francis for not respecting the victims and his wine family, but I've actually had personal dealings with Carl DeNaro and he's a bad guy. He's not interested in Son of Sam Truth. He was totally bullshitted by Maury Terry. Carl DeNaro is not a very smart person and he was enamored by Maury Terry and they would, quite frankly, they were more drinking buddies than they were anything else. And uh, Maury Terry treated Carl DeNaro horribly abused him like a farmer would have like a like a person would abuse a pack animal i'm gonna so, see hold on one second roro g 1999 thank you the great roro appreciate it roro. so thank carl so doesn't much. know shit about who shot him he actually thinks a woman shot him and uh he's even though i have billy the artist talking about how maury terry he he, he completely lied to maury terry uh carl still thinks that a woman shot him so let carl think a woman shot him he'll think that for the rest of his life and you know whatever and, and for those and who hit. don't know can you can you because over 100 people here can you explain briefly what are the maury terry files that you got to scan and you got to you know well they're maury terry's personal files um i had them since 2021 i was under nda not to say anything but through certain machinations of people who stabbed me in the back over the years i was stupid to share things privately they were leaked out um last october and and uh people threatened to, to put them public so i took that shit into my own hands i took responsibility and i put them out myself and i didn't care about the consequences whatsoever and there's been absolutely no consequence there will be no consequence and 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 now we have Maury Terry's files for the world to see. They've been publicly released. And if you look at them, they're shit stained garbage. They lead nowhere. They're the ravings of a total lunatic. Um, and so I def I've been defying all this cult heads for the last seven months to where's your shows proving the, that 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 your cult involvement and, and none has been forthcoming, of course. So this is the last one. This is a fun one. Here we go. The reality is he was After very this. socialized. Let me move this ahead. All right. This one is called The Mafia Hunts David Berkowitz. <gasps> the crowd, lonely, deeply. It's 1976 or 77 in Queens when um, somebody had spotted you. I thought they may have spotted you. You know, the police at that time had come to us. They were looking for help. And, and so we were, we were kind of looking for you at the time. I'm glad we didn't find you. Let's pay. Well, yeah. the main thing is Jesus found me. Jesus. Jesus. Found me. All right. So Michael Francis says, when he says we guys, we means only one thing. It doesn't mean me and my sister and, uh, you know, my buddy down the block. No, we means one thing. It means us, one of us, uh, the mob, the mafia, whatever you want to call it, the Columbos specifically. Uh, we were looking for you. According to Michael Francis, Michael, I'm not saying you're lying. I'm saying according to you. Uh, the police came to you guys uh, and said, uh, what are you guys doing over here? Don't you live here? I mean, aren't you worried about your gumads? Don't you want to protect the neighborhood? You guys got to do something about this. That was what the NYPD said to Michael Francis and, and the, the New York Italian mafia. What do you guys think about that? I think it's bloviating bullshit. First of all, the NYPD doesn't is I don't see anyone going to a mobster and saying enact vigilante justice because that's all they could actually do in the real world. How would the mob know who son of Sam was? 
the best that they could do is stake out a neighborhood and look for any strangers that may have, have driven through and got, and we all saw summer of Sam as, as, as uh, you know, that movie was, it, it wasn't meant to be a son of Sam movie. It was meant to right. show you the time period and, and right. people did get their asses kicked and sent to the hospital and probably in some cases even killed because local stupid idiots thought that they were the son of Sam. So uh, even Billy the artist told us that his friends thought that he was the son of Sam. So it was like a paranoid thing. Um, I think that that's bloviating bullshit by Mike Francis. I don't see how any mobster would have even known who to look for. So how would they have gotten them and how would they have helped NYPD? I mean, it's yeah, and, shit I've ever and heard. not to mention, I mean, he did. What, would, uh, what was was the Moskowitz his last shooting? Yeah. He did it yeah, right so in the he, mob neighborhood. He did his last shooting in the heart of the mafia neighborhoods. Uh, Bensonhurst, Bath Beach, you know, that whole area over there. I mean, you could throw a rock and you would hit a mobster back then. Um, you know, throw a rock and you're, you might hit a mobster's house back then. It is you know, it that's is. interesting. People that's an interesting insight into his psychiatry and psychology. He wanted to get caught. He, he, he got a parking ticket on purpose. And I wonder whether there was a second aspect to that where he knew <laughs> that the neighborhood he was in was heavily mobbed up and maybe he wouldn't have even of even escaped the scene because the park that he did that bath beach park was pretty jump in place there was a lot of people there that night and uh it's crazy that he got away but he just he just slipped yeah. away so maybe there was something there where he not only wanted to get caught but he wanted to get attacked and killed um by a by a by an angry mob and that would have been the neighborhood it, it would have happened in because as you say totally yeah i mean bay 17th and shore parkway he yep. said one thing in there, though, Crime Spot, I want to address. He goes, oh, I'm glad you didn't find me, but Jesus found me. Right. I would just like to say, when, David, did Jesus exactly find you? Because it's well documented. You became a Bible thumper in 1974. In fact, it turned off all your friends who I've spoken to. And it's well documented in your letters about how you've, you, you were a born again Christian in, in Kentucky. And then in 1979, after you're arrested, you're writing letters to your cousin, Susan Sugar, talking about being a Christian and a devout Christian now. But then we have this thing about how in 1988, he was walking the prison yard and a guy came up to him and said, David, God loves you. And then he got on his knees and prayed to God and read the Bible. And then he became a Christian. This dude's become a Christian three times, which means that he renounced Christianity. What's the freaking truth here? What's the story right. with this Christian right. stuff? Right, right. And as far as the Christianity in the 1970s, where does can you, if you could tell the audience where the evidence for that comes from, the 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 evidence about the Christianity in the, in the early days, 1970s. Well, it's well documented about his 1974 conversion. Everyone everyone knows about that. Even those who who were stupid enough to still believe Maury Terry knows that. And but of course, I heard about it straight from the source, right from his friends, uh, John right. Comparetto and Jeff Hartenberg, who were very, very taken. Uh, uh, and also they told us about Lenny Dapolito uh, and Ed Snedeker, who were getting all sorts of strange letters with religion in them. And they were all very turned off by it. And then um, if you read his letters to Abramson, included in there are letters to his cousin and, and letters to his psychiatrist about being a Christian in 1979, a devout Christian. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the famous uh, thing where you uh, story about him in 1988 becoming Christian. So it's like, what's the deal here? So I, I don't know. Connie G has a good question. You want to put put up? Yeah. Put that one up. You can read so it. why do many of the witness composites look like different people? This is the biggest red herring in Son of Sam. This is always and Connie, I'm not singling you out. I don't want you to think that I'm talking about you personally here because I'm not. But this is something that kind of gets me angry. Any law enforcement professional will tell you that witness descriptions are notoriously unreliable and that sketches are not to be taken for the gospel of anything. The biggest argument now that people have about cult involvement in son of sam was because some of the sketches didn't look like berkowitz that's perfectly normal in any um in any criminal investigation and quite frankly if you look at the sketches in son of sam many of them do look like berkowitz 
Uh, the ones up top look like Berkowitz. The one on the one at the bo- on the bottom right, that is Berkowitz on uh, yeah. both of those because that th- that looks just like them. And, and then the one the the two on the bottom left that everybody thinks is John Weedy's car, the urine drinker of of Warburton Avenue, according to Maury Terry. There's pictures of David Berkowitz with that exact hairstyle. So, um, and I've shown them extensively. So the reality is your premise is wrong, Connie. The witness composites actually look like David Berkowitz. If you know, if you, if you know a little bit more about what David Berkowitz's different hairstyles that he had, but, um, even if they didn't, which I can see that, you know, the ones on the bottom left don't have the same exact face. It means nothing in the grand scheme of things. It's absolutely, totally irrelevant to the to the discussion, right? As Book Club Warrior said, who was NYPD, it is what it is. Every witness interprets things differently, especially under exigent circumstances. So that's a law enforcement professional. It's not a layman speaking. Right. Let's see. Let's see. PT. PT's quote. What do you say? Yeah. Francesi did a disservice to Christianity with this interview, in my opinion. Do you have anything to say about that? Did a disservice to Christianity? I mean, just like uh, David Berkowitz was Christian like 27 times, there's like 27 different versions of Christianity. If you guys know what I mean, like, like praying to Christ, right? There's different versions of it. I don't know what – I think Michael Francis is coming from more of an evangelical kind of angle. And I think some of that stuff is kind of bizarre to begin with. No offense to anybody. So I don't think it did. I don't think it did. Well, I'm not a Christian and I really can't speak to Christian stuff, but I do know that there are commandments that thou shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shall not lie. Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not, um, you know, and so on and so forth. And they allowed Berkowitz, whether 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 they did it on purpose or not, they allowed Berkowitz to completely bullshit them in this interview, not by saying lies, but by but by omitting things from the record and actually out and actually in some cases out and out lying. David Berkowitz is not a liar, but he does lie. And right. um, and so that's the distinction that people have to understand. So I actually do think that there was a disservice to Christianity. I thought there was absolutely no thought given to the victims. I thought it was very tacky to be selling an alcoholic product. If you're a Christian, you shouldn't be hawking alcoholic products, especially before talking to one of the most notorious son of serial killers of all time. What a wasted, what a wasted opportunity. That's my biggest problem with this entire thing. So someone wrote an uh, uh, did a quote a comment up there that I want to talk to. I think it's what our comment boy, is it? I think it's our boy Brian again. Uh, with uh, all due respect. So the witnesses are lying. This guy is reaching. Everyone is lying with him. Come on, crime spot. He don't let. <laughs> so there's an inside joke about Ace of Base with me and Brian Baladino. Oh no, no, I'm talking about Brian Press. With all due respect. Oh, the other Brian. Okay, yeah. they do. No, as no, far no. as the up, sketches up more, go, up more, up more. Seven oh seven p.m. Oh, okay. 707, Brian Press. Okay, there you go. With all due respect, I never thought the sketches looked like David Berkowitz. All right. With all due respect, who cares? <laughs> your opinion doesn't yeah. matter, dude. I mean, I mean, I hate to be so glib about it, but your opinion means nothing. Berkowitz did the crimes. He was he pleaded guilty to them. He con- was convicted for them in a court of law. And here he is talking about them. So whatever you think about the sketches means absolutely nothing to anybody right right and keep in mind i mean i'm not telling you guys to believe anything this and that but i'm having manny on here because i've seen firsthand the research that he's done uh, i mean and he's been doing it way before even you know before youtube whatever but i've seen firsthand the last few years all the research manny has done as a matter of fact the first one of the first videos i ever put on my channel as i said before was uh I went to the the Placido shooting in uh, Bayside to uh, film it because that was how I was going to do my channel, film these locations. And then I saw Manny's channel and I said, wow, I did what I did was so embarrassing. I have to delete this video. <laughs> and I deleted it. And then ultimately me and Manny became friends in other ways. But, you know, I don't platform like lunatics, liars, weirdos on the channel. I, I have full faith in what Manny does. And uh, 
I know that. Yo, and the feeling is mutual, there. my man. I have nothing but respect for Cold yeah. Case NYC Crime Spot. The dude is killing it out there. I'm with trying. His, I'm trying with his <laughs> with his obscure and interesting uh, cold cases, and also his uh, great unique take on the mob genre by getting these really interesting characters like your interview with the piano player at Henry's bar, dude, that's, Oh history. yeah. You should have won a Pulitzer yeah, prize for that. I mean, that was amazing I appreciate stuff. It, man. Yeah. That was great to meet Al Capanero. I mean, what a legend, man. Wow. Yeah. That was great. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, once again, like you guys can believe what you want this and that, but, I don't want to harp on it. Strong Island's finest. I believe the mob asking the NYPD for help is true. I believe Dominic Monterio clarified this in one of his videos on Ross and Billy's channel. Ask Pete. All right. Yeah. Uh, I saw you texting me that too. Yeah. I'll definitely find that out. I'll look back on Dom's channel. The only thing I would say is I can't see Frank Pergola being any part of something like that, like trying to ask the mob to do anything because that guy hates the fucking mob. So I wonder what cops that would be that would do something like that. It makes you wonder. Right, and also, like I said, and let's just deal with this realistically. Nobody knew who they were looking for, so how is the mob going to be of any help other than vigilante justice to to right. possibly get some some innocent schlub and kill them on the street? Right. Ruby, thanks for finally joining us. How you doing? How you doing? Stop, Rubes. Berkowitz has had every excuse to blame someone else. So if there was someone else involved, he would be blaming them too. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the cult stuff is crap. Just watch my Billy the Artist interview. The Maury Terry fans are literally calling comic book characters the, the leaders of the Son of Sam cult at this point. So yeah. it's a freaking joke. It's, emba it's an embarrassment. And Maury Terry fans, you're an embarrassment. Remember that viral video from Subway? You're an embarrassment. It was like one black, it was like know, one black dude talking to another one. I don't know it was hilarious. Stony Curtis, if that MF was a real, I don't know if MF means Michael Francis or a mother. He was a real Christian. He has to explain to the Lord why grieving families were left hanging when he knows. Exactly. No, no, there's no contrition. There's no apologies. There's no sense of remorse to the victims. That's why I believe that it's very possible Berkowitz is still seriously warped in the head and 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 actually getting off on manipulating people uh like like francis and shari thank you for the soup for the cash app much appreciated thank you so, so much <laughs> i can see brian's angry neither does yeah i mean let's just agree to disagree you know it's fine i mean no one likes to have their opinion um shot down but you're not informed so i mean you know Composite sketches really aren't used anymore. SOS would have been nabbed by the second shoot. Yeah, today for sure. For sure. Definitely. So definitely. put on Brian Palladino. He's your boy, right? Oh, uh, I know him just from the live stream. He appeared one day speaking about Ace of Base, and I unironically really like Ace of Base. Uh, I mean, I'm not afraid to admit it. So I thought it was really funny that he. So we got a little inside joke. I have no problem with Brian. He's cool. What but uh, you're, you're a guest. He's a right, guest. You're welcome to uh, chat it up. What about the handwritten letters that didn't match Berkowitz? And then there's a hmm. There's always a hmm at the end of one of these and three question marks. Brian, all I have to say is go to my channel, look up the letter series of the playlist or anything that says letters. And I do extensive handwriting analysis. I, I analyze the letters with letters found in his apartment that we know he wrote. The, I compare all the letters to every known bit of hand, right? The Berkowitz wrote the son of Sam letters. It was a complete joke that someone else wrote them. I mean, just watch well, my man, really the artist video, man. You got beef for two Brian's right now. Yeah, I know. Wow. It's the old, I don't know what I'm talking world. about. Okay. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that from some uninformed douchebag, I'd be a very rich man. Keep on believing what you want. Brian doesn't Chris Archula or the other. Chris Archula, my man. How you doing? I like Chris. Chris. Chris is a new hey. viewer. I like this dude. Nah, he's awesome. Yeah, he came over to your channel uh, after I had you that uh, the other night. He's a he's yeah. a good sub. He's a good. Uh, he'll show up in the live chats. He's a good dude. So Manny, I know you said you wanted to keep this an hour, so I know you might bounce. We can go off a little any, longer. We can go a little longer. You know, you might bounce off any time now. Now I know you had an issue with the uh, with the wine, right? I know you had a bit of an issue. Did have an issue with it. 
but I want, I want, I want to go over a couple of things. I want to go over a couple of things. Michael Francis, Manny, he sells this pomegranate wine, okay? <laughs> and for my money, this might be the finest looking bottle of wine I've ever seen in my life. Look at, can you believe this? Look at this. Ooh, gross. You don't like that? I mean, it looks like something else, but I mean, it looks kind of cool. A pomegranate bottle that's actually it looks a like open heart surgery. Looks <laughs> like some. I mean, let's just face it. It looks wow, like that was vagina. me. I thought it was, I mean, it was cool. Disgusting. I, guess. I don't it. think that that's a very good look personally. I think that, that looks horrible. <laughs> it looks like a pomegranate, though. It does look like a pomegranate, but uh, that's. I don't know. I thought it was right, cool, well, look, but you know what? Their own. You're still my boy. No, but I want to get into this. I want you to show you something with the wine. Uh, and I want to I want to talk about kind of with the Christian angle with this. So Armenia is an ancient. This is where he sources his wine, Manny, from Armenia. Armenia is an ancient civilization found on the ancient Babylonian map. Control plus that evidence. so we can read it. Oh, you want, to, want me to plus it? Plus it. Fucking guy. What do we do? Control plus, right? Yep. All I'm trying to do is make it so the audience could read along. Yeah, you guys my know man. I'm not, I'm not I don't really know about tech like Manny does. I know I have a YouTube channel, but as far back as 90,000 BC, the humans, and we have like Noah's Ark's boat, I guess what that is. The oldest leather shoe in the world was discovered in an Armenian cave. Scientists believe it was left behind five and a half thousand years ago. Five and a half thousand years ago. Five and a half thousand years ago. Okay. Scientists believe. Okay. Well, why why are you so hung up on five and a half well, thousand? I don't years? know much about religion, but I thought Jesus was only like a couple of Yeah, but that doesn't have anything to do with Christians, with what they're writing about there. Okay. I'm confused. Many cultures and religions consider this ancient place the cradle of civilization in the Holy Land. Many believe that Armenia's Mount Ararat is the final resting place of Noah's Ark. So what I'm getting at is with the wine and with the uh, Mount Ararat and the Bible, this is why apparently he's sourcing his wine from Armenia. So you you, you kind of didn't like the winding in the beginning, but I'm here to let you know <laughs> that there is a religious aspect behind it. He's not just hawking any wine. It's wine from the birthplace of Noah's Ark. Just want Listen, I, I like Armenians. My my uh, mechanic is an Armenian, Dikran Hovnanian. I love the dude. He's like a part of my family. I've known him since 1982. When my father used to go to him when he was a teenager, uh, not my father, Dick Ran. Um, actually, it's Dick Ran, but I call him Dick Ran. I just find it funnier. But uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, what can I tell you, man? I mean, Francesi, look, everyone's got to make a living. I'm not here to, to, to diss Francis personally. I'm sure that I would get along with him if we spoke, if we had a sit down. But quite frankly, talking the language of his of his life, his former life, the dude muscled into my territory and he took a shit in my living room. So I don't like what he did. I'm, I have a big problem with this interview. I would give my left nut to interview Berkowitz in a sense. It's what everyone wants to see. And and uh, and, and and I'm blacklisted uh, because I know the truth. I mean, this is kind of warped that the only people that he gives interviews to are these people who were talking about, Oh, I don't know why I did it. And I loved my birth mother. And um, yeah, I was hanging out with Carlton V. Gajusek in, in Untermeyer Park. I mean, they're allowing him to who sow them first and foremost, they should have more respect for themselves. These who sowing the public and he's insulting the victims at every step because there's no contrition. There's no feelings of sorrow or guilt. There's no, not even talking about them. They're not even human. And that's why I think that Berkowitz is still the same monstrous, narcissistic, egotistical maniac that he is, that he was back then. And I think that he's playing, possibly playing these people for suckers. So Pendragon, an Armenian approached him to partner with him and his famous wine. His partner shared the wine story with Michael. I'm not sure where he had it. I'm not hating on him. We're not hating uh, on Manny him. Manny was talking in the beginning about the Christian thing with the wine, and I simply said, well, his reason, uh, even when it comes down to the wine, has a Christian connection. I'm not hating. Maybe I was being a little snarky in my tone, but I'm not hating. I don't hate on people's success. That's for losers. I like, just literally uh, said, right. And I just literally said, everyone can make a living. I don't have a problem with that. I just yeah. actually said that my problem is mixing the wine selling and the advertising with the, 
historic interview with one of the most notorious serial killers of all time who has not right. given an interview in years. You're mixing the yeah. two. It's an insult to all of us. And it's an insult first and foremost to the victims and their families. They should be ashamed yeah. of themselves. Yeah, I don't hate. We don't hate. I'm not hating on anybody. I don't care. I said multiple times during this uh, upload, please go to Michael Francis' channel. Please subscribe. Please watch the interview in full. Uh, I normally don't even do reaction videos. This might be like the first reaction video I've ever done, but being that he muscled in on my friend's territory, I figured <laughs> I would put have up. Manny put here to, to talk about it. I think it's cool. I think it's interesting. And like I said before, guys, you're going to have people in the mob genre. They're going to be going to be do a Michael Francis reaction video. They're going to treat it on some troll shit. We're here looking at it with an expert historical analysis not on some troll shit we're not making fun of him right and we showed you rad i don't care if he fucking yeah, testified. couldn't care about any care. of that crap his life was his life he did what he had to do in his life i couldn't care yeah. less i wish really the mob still ran new york city yeah. um pd yeah, put, up P, put, yeah, put up pd's quote not meaning this offensively, but getting an interview isn't exactly muscling in. I agree, and I don't take that right. offensively, Pete. Well, yeah. What I what I have a problem with is that listen, the simple fact is if the interview got 300 views, I wouldn't give a shit. The the simple fact is right now it's probably up to 160,000 views. It's gonna get probably two, three hundred thousand views. That's a lot of eyeballs on this. And he's perpetuating myths and mythologies and urban legends and who so I don't like it. As a person who sp I basically have spent my life doing this the last three years, I've I've gained a lot, but I've also lost a lot. And and it personally in my personal life, because of this work that I do, I'm invested in this. So so the issue that I have is, is, is not that he's muscling in on an interview or getting an interview. It's that he's taking a shit on the subject that I've worked so hard to um, to get the truth out on. And I'm pissed off about that. There you go. 5,500 years of reference to the Old Testament. No, it's from the Old Testament. Yeah. And also, if for anyone thinking that I was like poking at religion, I don't have anything against religion here. At the beginning of this, I was actually sticking up for religion because Michael Francis in the beginning of his video. And this is why some people, any religion, sometimes they put their foot in their mouths and they don't even realize it because they're so consumed by their ideology. In the beginning of that video of the David Berkowitz interview, he plainly says that you don't know what forgiveness is unless you're a Christian. You can't understand the concept of forgiveness. I'm sorry, but anybody with a fucking brain, nobody buys that. Nobody buys that. You nobody can teach buys a child that. forgiveness for Christ's sake. No, no uh, pun intended. Ha <laughs> ha. I know but, plenty you know, of Muslims who have forgiveness. I know plenty of Jewish people with forgiveness yeah. in their hearts. This is absolutely I mean, ridiculous. You know. Even them, them Satan uh, people, you know, they could forgive you too, you know? So, <laughs> but yeah, just wanted to throw that out there too. This is not a religious bashing thing. You know? Connie G is, is dead on in her comment. Exactly. This was the same old Berkowitz, just a different interviewee. I mean, interviewer, it's, it, it, there was, it was such a wasted opportunity. My biggest problems with this interview have nothing to do with Michael Francis or Michael Caparelli personally. I could be their best friends, whatever. I still would have an issue with, 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 with number one, selling wine, number two, perpetuating myths, and number three, the absolutely wasted, completely wasted opportunity that was given right. to these people. They didn't even appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I think it ends up just looking more like a flex. Like, look what I can do. Look, the, look at the interviews that I could pull off on my channel. You know, and they're just trying to, you know, because this audience, you know, when you get to that level of uh, subscribership, um, just like Sammy the Bull, you know, at, at some point, your your following almost becomes a little cult like, I guess. And it doesn't matter what you put out; they're going to be like, "Oh, this is the, this is amazing." Have you seen what Michael has done now? This now, so I think he's not catering to even doing a different interview or even trying to pull some of the, you know, for lack of a better word, demonic acts that he did. Pull some of that out of him, you know. I don't right, even think he was trying to go for that. 
No, and I guarantee you at this moment in time, Francis is not sitting here watching this video. He hasn't watched my walk and talk. He couldn't care less of the the reaction to the video. It's just was one more thing he did, and he's and he moved on. And in the meanwhile, I have a big now stinking pile of shit left right on my subject. Yeah. There's another comment, a really nice comment. Dylan Chase, yo, NYC Crime Spot, your show is the best podcast, hands down. I have subscribed to your channel on every damn device at home and six computers at work. I got you back no matter what. Love it. Yo, Dylan, that's that's one of the nicest things that anyone has ever said. Thank you so much, buddy. Are those all your six computers at work? Or are you just like uh, messing with your coworkers, making them watch my stuff? Either way, pretty good. <laughs> so Thank Book you, Club bro. saying out there that they filmed three hours of that interview and only edited it down to one. And he wants to right? see the whole. And he wants to see the whole thing. Yeah, I would. I maybe my opinion will change if I see the whole thing. I mean, okay. there were clearly edit points in that video. That's one thing that I don't do in my videos. Um, when I do a walk and talk, and even in my live, well, you can't edit live streams, but I never. I just let start the camera and I roll, and I never do one edit point. Um, I just think everything is just more honest that way, unless you're going for an edited look. But in an interview like that. Yeah. Uh and Pendra Pendra Pen Pendragon. Uh Jesus drank wine though. Maybe there is no quandary. Once again, there's no issue with it. I think that I think that if Michael Francis was hawking t-shirts or his uh master class on how to be uh entrepreneurship, it still would have been I think Manny probably still would have had a problem with it. It's tacky and low rent. Absolutely. Um, although it does add a special, a special um layer on it when it is alcohol because i mean i always thought that you know christianity looked down upon alcohol drinking but then again i'm not a christian it's not my place to say anything and honestly i don't give a shit pendragon arthur pendragon <laughs> it's a reference that i probably don't know but i will look it up now that you said <laughs> it i'm sorry arthur pendragon uh, Francis with, with the religious preaching has turned me off a long time ago with him. It's cool to have faith, but it seems fake sometimes. Okay. I mean, listen, I'm not here to judge people on their beliefs or their veracity of their beliefs. Right. The only thing that I can do is critique these two guys on the substance. And, um, again, my substance is wasted opportunity and, and, and perpetrating myths to two huge disservices to the true crime community. Right, right, right. And um, and as far as his Christianity as a whole, like, I'm, I've never even been one of the people that question that. Like, uh, people go around all the time. I hear it all the time. I think that whole thing is fake. Maybe you do, Manny. But I think it's a lot of, it's, it's a hell of a lot of work to, like, fake something like that. Like, how many talks, how many, I guess, I guess if it's paying the bills, I guess maybe that answered my question. I have no opinion of it. Everybody, you can never get into someone's head and really know. Right, right. Um, so it doesn't even, there's no point in even talking about it. Can you put up the darkness underneath comment? Yes. Uh, yeah, Pergola, yeah. Hey, B-Riv, I'm going to go ahead and interview OC Homicide Detective Frank Pergola, who took down the DeMeo crew. If you want to interview him after, I will introduce you again. Of course I do. You know I do. I'm going well, to tell darkness underneath. And darkness underneath. I know you're. I know you're. Obviously, you're watching now. You just commented. I want to talk to Pergola like you wouldn't believe. This guy's name and is on so many Son of Sam, Detective DD fives and documents like you wouldn't believe. Especially in the uh, in the Christine Freund murder. I would love to talk to this guy. I emailed somebody. I forget exactly who. Um, somebody who's who was uh, uh, affiliated with frank P pergola that you knew uh crime spot but the person never got back to me so um let's make this happen yeah yeah not only did frank work on a but he lived in that area i believe frank lived in bath beach i gotta speak to pergola he's he's an important person in this case for the guys that don't know he is the one that found harvey chris rosenberg's machine gun body in his bmw by floyd bennett field in 1979 that was Frank Pergola, Pergola, however you want to say it. <laughs> the legend himself. Any closing words, Mr. Manny Grossman? Well, cold case crime spot. I just want to say thank you once again for having me on your airwaves. I always love uh, appearing on your show. you got a great audience. I love uh, meeting new people in the audience. 
And I think that we did a good reaction video today. Like you said, we didn't get into the gutter. We didn't insult anyone personally. And we didn't make this about uh, the personalities involved. This was all about substance and fact. The simple uh, conclusion that I can come up with about this interview is that Mike Franchisi doesn't know the first thing about Son of Sam. The dude is a poser. He shouldn't have ste stepped foot into this subject. It was an insult to the victims. It was an insult to the victim's family. It was an insult to the Son of Sam community. It was an insult to Son of Sam truth. He took a huge shit in my living room that now I got to clean up. And, uh, and so I'm not, <laughs> so now I'm not happy about it, bro. Like that's crap. I mean, if you're going to interview the son of Sam, we're not talking about little, uh, the PD twiddly sticks down the block. You're talking about David Berkowitz. The guy doesn't have that many years left. He's still mental compost mental. He's still pretty good in his, in his brain. Why am I sitting here talking about, Oh, <laughs> I didn't know why I killed and I loved my mother and I did death defying feats as a child. Who gives a shit about that? And who gives a shit about Christianity? I want to know about the crimes. Yeah. I want to know about Maury Terry's bribes. Well, he doesn't want to talk about it. He's done. Right. Well, that's the issue. I think that we're, that we're, that we're dealing with here. Berkowitz will never talk to me. I'm going to put my letter in the mailbox to Berkowitz. I've already announced that publicly. He knows who I am. Allegedly, he hates my guts, but he knows that I'm the real deal and he knows that I got his number. And that's that's the real reason why he'll he'll never speak to me. But listen, maybe one day you guys out there and, and we'll all get a Grossman Berkowitz sit down because that's the only way we're ever going to get the real story about this spree called the son of Sam. Yeah. And with that cold case, I will say thank you very much. Well, DL, great point. Before you go, 200,000 people are now feeling sorry for David. That's a good, really good point. I wanted to ask you about this, too. What was with David Berkowitz's elbow? He seemed to have a massive growth on his elbow. What is that about? As Ruby said, dude needs Dr. Pimple Popper. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you want me to say? I don't know what the hell it is. All right. All right. I guess so. I guess so. Too much Muay Thai in uh, prison, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Too many Hu Sao combination plates. You know? <laughs> <laughs> good shit, man. This was really good. This worked out better than I thought it would. At least, at least I think so. I know we kind of did it last minute. Yeah, it worked uh, out. It's great. I mean, you got to you got to hit these things when the energy is out there. I mean, as soon as I saw this video and it was the the numbers were unbelievable. I was like, I'm going to make a reaction video to this because well, not only was I pissed off, but also I'm a producer. I mean, let's face it. When the energy of something is hot, that's when you strike. I mean, <laughs> it's no secret. Yeah. It's no secret. Like I said in the beginning, you're going to get a good show out of this. And I was right as far as I'm concerned. Of course, uh, this is my channel. So I think everything I did was good. But you're going to get like another Mob 2 channel talking about this. You know, Michael Francis coming from from it on some troll shit and not really knowing the case, not knowing about it. So I think that this is the best reaction. I'm calling it now. This will be the best reaction aside from Manny's that he released on his own channel, which everybody is going to go follow. One of the best reactions on YouTube. Uh as far as this interview that just dropped. Any last words, Manny? I already said my last words and right. uh, I'll just say thanks again. And thanks to everyone in the audience. And uh, please go and subscribe to my channel. Can't wait to uh, continue on the fight for son of Sam truth. All right. With that, Manny, thank you, bro. Let's talk soon. Good to have you on, man. Awesome show. Thanks. All right, everybody. That was the great Manny Grossman. Somebody who I met, I don't know, a little over two years ago, I believe, at this point. And, uh, yeah, it all happened with uh, his Son of Sam work. And there was some crossover on some files he dropped, and then we uh, we started doing some good videos. So let me see. BK Sal Crook, I'm about to head out. Thanks for stopping in and saying hello. Chris Archula. Uh, Manny gets a lot deeper into the Francis. It's much more interesting. Thank you so much. All the way, Manny. Yeah. 
Hooper 45. Great show, lads. Manny is the man. Thank you, Stoney Curtis. That's funny, Stoney Curtis. I know someone in real life that looks like uh, Stoney Curtis, and we call him Stoney Curtis. Uh, okay, okay. I'll read a couple more comments and I'm going to, I hope you guys like this. I mean, I know that some of you guys, you know, uh, said things, maybe you didn't agree with Manny or whatever it was. That's fine. We like the love. We like the hate. We like the disagreement. We like it all. We just keep it cool. You know what I'm saying? Thank you, Manny. Once again, I just saw your private uh, message. Thank you, man. Till next time. Don't turn, don't turn around. Don't turn around. <laughs> Unless you see the sign. Make sure you guys check Manny's workout. Great stuff. That is correct. That is correct. William Echeverria. Echeverria. Yeah. Great stuff as always. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great show, MIC, as always. Watch your shit. Peace. Thank you. So, Rab. Unique Mastiffs. Thank you, man. Yeah, I figured it out that you were, in fact, blocked. I don't know why. Uh, not sure. I really can't say how. Uh, I don't know what happened or... But I figured it out, Unique Mastiffs, and you're here. I figured it out. I blocked a lot of people. Hey, Ro, I'm working. Caught the show later. Didn't get any notifications. Yeah, that's crazy, B. Cal. You know how many people don't get notifications when I do these things? It's really fucking annoying, to be honest with you. 88 people still here. Thank you. The truth pisses off people. The truth. I can't even read. The truth pisses people off. We support the movement, man. No who sow. Yeah, no who sow combination plates. Come on. The Fun House, nine ninety nine, great show. You and Manny make a great team. Thank you so much, Fun House. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Or sister. I started watching Manny's older videos yesterday. Awesome, Chris. Yeah, there's a lot there. Ruby, does Manny have everything he's ever done uh, on the channel? Because I know some of that got like archived at some point. Uh, Ruby, I got to get your number. Hit me up on Instagram so I could send you these uh, notifications uh, when I'm going to go on. Because yeah, there's a problem. But yeah, Ruby, if you know if Manny has everything uh, up there or or some of that stuff archived, because I haven't really like looked back in a while. Darkness underneath. We'll talk later about those. Huh? He definitely is going to want to talk to Frank. I'm going to get Frank. Okay, good. Oh, you have the archive, Ruby. Okay, so it's not really on the channel. All right, well... Uh... Uh, I don't know. I guess if if uh, Chris Arsula wanted that, maybe there's a way to get it to him. If you want to email me, uh, Chris Arsula. I think I was added to the drive, Ruby, but uh, I think I'm there. Chris Arsula, we'll just do it this way. Chris Arsula, if you want to email me, nyccrimespot at gmail.com. If you want access to all that archival stuff, uh, email me, and then I'll work it out with Ruby. And she could add your email, I believe. And that'll probably be the best way to do it. G78, my man in Ireland. Did I not say hello to you tonight? Thank you, my man. Good to see that you are here, buddy. Frank thought Son of Sam went after his daughter. Oh, wow. That's crazy. That's crazy. Not crazy. Yeah, yeah. No doubt, Chris Arsula. NYCCrimespot at gmail.com. That goes for anybody. NYCCrimespot at gmail.com. Hit me up if you want to talk. If you got, well. I didn't mean it like that. I mean, we can talk, but, you know, I'm just kidding. Hit me up if you have any questions, comments, concerns, any information, any intel, anything that you might think that I will find interesting. Appreciate that. Bet Mulligan, what's going on? Weird show, got to say. Uh, yeah, I like that. Weird show. I'll take it. Yeah, why not? Before I go, one more time, please sub to Manny here. This is uh, the link to the channel. Check out Manny. Uh, I always say doesn't take much to hit the subscribe you just click that bing and subscribe it's a flex of the index finger and even if you like you're not going to watch the channel you never know maybe you'll be sitting on the couch one day you put on the youtube app and manny or me or any any channel oh this guy's live or oh, I, I forgot i subscribed to this channel oh let me watch it and then maybe you might like it you know that's happened to me before i'm subscribed to so many things on youtube i don't even know how i even ended up subscribing to these channels but sometimes they'll be like oh what's this and i'll be like oh shit pretty cool glad i subscribed to that all right, guys, I'll stop talking. Thank you to everybody that joined me tonight. We're about an hour and 40 minutes in. Uh, I'm not home unless I would be posting. No, it's all good, Ruby. Yeah, no, it's all good. We appreciate you regardless. Thank you to my great mods. Uh, Ruby, Roro G. Thank you to Pete D. Thank you to Roro G for the $19.99. Funhouse for the $9.99. 
appreciate both of you very much. Have a good night, Chris Archula. Uh, let me know if you want that. I'll hook it up. And uh, listen, guys, I got a few things. I'm going to go out this weekend. I'm going to film some street shit. Uh, we're going to go out. I think I'm going to go out to Long Island, get some work done out there. My man, Go67, thanks for being here, my bro. I'll see you in Loomis's chat. I listen to your videos while I'm working. Thank you, Anshar. I'll make you a mod, too. I can't do it here, though, Anshar, but I gotta, I'll got uh, doesn't let me do it here. I think it used to let me do it here. What you need to do, Anshar, is you need to like make a comment. When you get a chance, go to my channel. Comment on my last video or something. And I think I could give you the moderator status through the comment on that video. So go ahead and do that. Uh, Roro G, good night. Ruby, good night. Everybody have a beautiful night. And uh, Lord Face, everyone of the world, peace be with you 100% all day, every day. We're going to put my intro up one more time. We'll use it as an outro. I'm going to get out of here. Thank you so much. Over 100 people in here at one point. Really appreciate that. That means a lot to me that you showed up for my friend Manny. Anytime I have somebody come on and you guys show up, it really means the world to me. You guys have a great night. BK Sal, my man, the legend from Brooklyn. Everybody, love you. From a couple of years on, things are real horrible here in New York, all over. You're dealing with a lot of uh, people that are maniacs today. You're dealing with an individual who's very basic, who only knows two things, rip off or be ripped off. Many of those who make good by being bad are nowhere to be seen these days. I'd be afraid. Of course I'd be afraid. He's a sick guy. He'd kill any time. Yeah, but we're so there isn't anything on earth that I will hide from or back up from. People seem not to understand the close relationship between organized crime and street crime. And certainly in dealing with street crime in his area or any other kind of crime, uh, the uniform uh, patrol... Presenzano shot four times, his throat cut. Presenzano was allegedly connected... To